Hi everyone, welcome to the first ever virtual property show. My name is Bruno Simao. I'm a specialist property attorney at Bruno Simao Attorneys and in Intigen Wealth. And today we're here to demystify the law, especially with relation to property investments. I've been in this industry for about 15 years. My primary focus has always been around property. Uh, the fields of law I practice in specifically were commercial and litigation, which pretty much spent, it meant that I spent a lot of time in court dealing over disputes relating to commercial matters and properties. I'm also one third of the Property Law Alliance, which is, which is a group of three firms of attorneys in Johannesburg that specialize in property and that offer insights to our clients every once in a while, just relating to legal matters that interest property investors with respect to investment strategies, rental collections, evictions, you name it. So one of the primary issues that I tend to find when, uh, when my clients approach me is how the law tends to hamper or hinder property investments. Um, it's, it's needless to say I have found in general that um, a lot of my clients do, don't appreciate some of the restrictions um, that the law imposes when it comes to um, acquiring properties or selling properties or even dealing with properties on, on a daily basis. Now, what uh, and and this is a common misconception because what people don't realize is our country actually has one of the best systems, for example, um, with respect to deeds registries, where we've actually got um, a, a proper register of ownership, so that we know where the property is, to whom the properties belong, and we know to whom they're being transferred. So there's a lot of pluses and upsides when it comes to our law. And as property investors, it's not really a matter of challenging and confronting the law to the degree where it hampers you, but rather finding useful mechanisms to use the law to your advantage and as a tool to take you forward and advance you in your property journey. And this is what we're going to be discussing today. It's not about confronting. It's about using to your advantage. So one of the first aspects that we tend to deal with um, is, is the offer to purchase. Why do I bring this first? Or why do I bring this up first, rather? This is one of the primary contracts that we're exposed to when entering into a property transaction. Now, a lot of the seasoned investors out there, because remember, this talk is for both entry level and seasoned investors, because there's just so much that can be explored, so much to learn when it comes to property acquisitions. And I, I challenge a seasoned investor, if there's anything in this talk that I speak about that uh, for some reason, uh, if, if, there's, uh, if you know absolutely everything um, that I'm speaking about in this talk, please approach me later because that actually means that I've got so much to learn from you. Because the reality is I've been doing this every day for years. I've looked at thousands of contracts and you will still find contracts out there that will surprise me with innovative clauses that clients put in that we need to test, that we need to take to a court, run through the system, see how judges interpret it. So there's always something to learn. So this is intended for all levels of investors. We're just going to discuss it. We're going to go through it and in the Q&A section. You're always welcome to throw some questions at me and we can see what, uh, what we can come up with. Now, the offer to purchase, um, it, 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 it seems to be a very simple document. And most of the seasoned investors out there would say, well, you know, we've dealt with a few. We've submitted plenty of offers. Why do we need to now learn about offers to purchase? The offer to purchase sets up the transaction and effectively causes transfer to be taken into your name. So we need to make sure that everything in relation to this contract is done correctly. Now, don't get me wrong. No one's saying that this contract is so difficult to interpret or so complex that people should um, spend a lot of money trying to, to take it to, to attorneys, to study it and give legal opinions. It, it, does, it is generally a, a simplistic document. What I'm trying to teach you, what I'm trying to um, equip you with are the tools to be able to pick up certain red flags. What does not conform with industry norms? What would one expect to find in a contract and what seems peculiar? What are the implications of certain provisions in the contract that we should actually consider? And that's the type of conversation that I want to have today because it's very important to realize that 
the more offers you submit, the more you get used to it. So after one, it's going to be great because you're going to be able to recognize the offers and keep submitting them. But there are always certain things, and even the seasoned investors can't deny that they have a certain checklist, mental checklist, where, that they go down as they're about to sign an offer to purchase. So even if they don't read every single word, there's certain red flags that they look out for just to make sure that the right person's paying the right amounts, that the right liabilities uh, um, are, are being held or vest, uh, vest in the correct people. There's a whole range of clauses. And I feel it is just important that we, we look at these and we do an assessment every time we submit an offer just to make sure that we're comfortable with these clauses. So uh, before, before I carry on, I just want to give a basic history or understanding of what a contract actually entails. So in, in South African law, we enter into agreements on a daily basis, any sort of agreement. Even when you walk into the shop and you buy something from, from a retailer, you're entering into a form of agreement. So keep in mind that agreements come in all shapes and sizes. They can be oral, they can be in writing, some are signed, some aren't signed. So to enter into an agreement, you, you, uh, there's certain very basic requirements and all contracts or all agreements require these to be fulfilled. But when dealing with sale, we take it one step further. So we've already got an agreement in place. It's where two parties had consensus over something, but now we're looking to create a specific form of this agreement. So for example, a lease agreement would require that a person merely use something for a certain limited period of time in exchange for which they're going to pay consideration. Where for example, a sale agreement is where a person takes transfer and delivery of something in exchange for consideration. So these very specific elements define the specific type of contract that you enter into. So once, once you're comfortable, for example, that you have a sale agreement, and remember sale can, can relate to anything, can relate to chairs, can relate to cars, can relate to houses. However, when it relates to immovable property, you then take it one step further. There's some legislation out there that defines and regulates how these contracts need to be entered into. So the Alienation of Land Act has certain very basic requirements. The contract must be in writing, which means that you cannot sell a property unless the contract is in writing. Um, it needs to be reduced to writing and signed by the parties. And so again, um, it's a specific requirement that the contract actually be printed out and signed by hand and clients. Unfortunately, digital signatures don't fly when it comes to a uh, sale of immovable property. Um, you'll see, for example, that the Consumer Protection Act also carries certain implications when it comes to the sale of properties. Because if a person sells properties for a living and a property can be considered as part of their business, they still need to comply with the Consumer Protection Act. They need to make the right warranties with respect to things like defects and uh, the, uh, the property's condition and the, all the rest. Uh, the amount still due on the property, all of these are warranties um, that, that the CPA, uh, the Consumer Protection Act, would cover. Uh, the Alienation of Land Act also has very specific requirements when it comes to uh, installment sale agreements. Installment sale agreements um, are specifically defined as, as the, uh, we're not going to go into a lot of detail regarding installment sale agreements today, but they have a number of requirements that are necessary in order to be able to properly register these installment sale agreements against the deed of transfer in the deeds office and certain basic requirements, a lot of protection rights for purchases. So before a person enters into a contract, we need to be mindful of the fact that there are certain intricacies that we need, uh, we need to comply with. Um, which, which for the most part your attorneys would help with. That's, that's the nice thing. Um, most, most attorneys would be able to, get, to take you through this journey and assist you with the, the provisions of these contracts. But what I normally advise persons is, please remember there's certain red flags that you need to be aware of because when you go out there, you're the one negotiating the contract, not us. We're the ones implementing and executing on the contract and making sure that whatever transfer need to needs to take place is executed properly. But the bottom line is you need to understand the nature of these contracts if you're going to negotiate their terms with a seller, for example, if you're a property investor buying property or with a purchaser if, if you just happen to be selling property. So there's a couple of clauses that I... There's a couple of clauses that I tend to focus on. So these are... A, this comprises a list of the most common clauses. And you'll see the ones that are marked in red are the ones that we're going to have a bit of time to discuss today. Unfortunately, the other ones we can save for maybe one of the Property Alliance webinars, which we do every Wednesday. 
Um, if you post some questions, I'd be happy to answer it in the coming Wednesdays. Um, otherwise, we do consultations where we assist clients with this sort of thing. Um, or another, another avenue to follow, for example, is the SA Property Investors Network. Uh, we do do a lot of talks there where we do discuss some of these concepts. So yeah, having access to this information should not be difficult. So the ones marked in red are the ones that I do want to focus on today. Um, and we'll then, take it to, we'll then take it from there. So when it comes to parties, you'll see the diagram in front of you um, speaks about a number of different entities. And then right in the middle, we're, we're looking at certain basic principles that most of us as property investors strive towards. Now, first thing about parties that we need to be very careful of is the Alienation of Land Act requires that the parties be properly defined and shown in the contract, which means that all their details need to be very clear in the contract. So that's the first thing that you now need to bear in mind, because as a seller, what I sometimes find is if you sell a property to a buyer that happens to be a a company, for example, that has no assets inside and that was simply created for the purchase of this property, there is a lot less accountability in this transaction and in this sale. So a big warning when it comes to the definition at defining the parties in the agreement is that if you are dealing with juristic persons, companies, make sure that you have a resolution that shows every single director in that company. Make sure that all the directors have authorized the purchase or sale of that property. Same applies to trusts. All the trustees should authorize that transaction. So you as a seller or a buyer should make 100% sure that this is the case because there's been ample case law where sales have been set aside or interdicted merely because there was a lack of authority on the part of the seller or the purchaser. So the de defining the parties is quite important when it comes to aspects like this. Another important element when it comes to defining the parties is your selection of the entity in which you're going to contract with. So now I'm referring more to property investors and what entity they intend to use. So you'll see, for example, here, uh, examples of a natural person, trusts, companies, and uh, a combination of these. It is very important because remember, you as a property investor are now binding yourself into a contract. You're going to take transfer of this property into your selected entity or into your own personal name. Now, the downside to this is there is a level of commitment when it comes to this because to move this property out of your name at a later stage will necessitate the incurring of costs. Um, it, there might be capital gains tax that you might it may be liable for. You will probably have to pay transfer duty again, depending on the value of the property. So your selection of the entity that you buy it in now is actually very important. And again, this isn't to complicate the scenario and make it difficult for people to make offers. Remember, you only need to do this once. You set up your investment structures correctly you know exactly how to move forward with them. But my suggestion is always set up these investment structures first before moving forward, because ideally as a property investor, you're looking for the perfect balance of asset protection, tax efficiency, and financing efficiency. And effectively, asset protection speaks for itself. Tax efficiency, everyone wants to pay as little tax as possible. We did a calculation the other day when somebody passes away, um, there's certain very conservative calculations where 42% of their estate um, gets used up in the payment of taxes and costs and the like. It is a real thing. So investment structuring when it comes to building a property portfolio is paramount because trying to fix it later is sometimes problematic on its own and lands up costing you more money. So please be careful with this. Also, when it comes to investment structures, a very interesting concept, and this is where the um, seasoned investors may be interested, is it's not just about picking a purchaser. It's also about the relationship of this property investor and this property. So for example, you'll see, uh, um, you'll see again, obviously the natural person trust and company. But there's different ways that these can actually be combined 
to suit commercial needs. So a lot of people speak in the industry about joint ventures. They speak about stock fells, they speak about partnerships, and they speak about angel investors. But what are these? And what do these parties have to do with these type of relationships? Remember, at the end of the day, when you're buying a property, these are the different type of relationships that you're possibly using in order to acquire the property. A joint venture, for example, is a relationship with another third party where together you guys decide to buy, a, to buy the property together. There's different ways of doing it. I've seen people do it in trusts. I've seen people most of the time do it in companies. Things like stock files, for instance, um, it's very important that people realize when setting up a stock file, um, setting up a stock file without actually setting up a company that controls the stock file is sometimes a problem, especially when it comes to obtaining financing from banks. So these are considerations that everyone should have when investing in properties because these will impact on how you move forward. And again, it does form part of the structuring journey and it is something that you should consider when making the offer. But again, remember, only once. This is not a question of every single time you need to go through this exercise of trying to figure out what the best thing to do is. Just make sure that you get educated beforehand. Make sure that you've got your structure set up beforehand so that your life is easier moving forward. So now moving on to the next clause that I like to discuss is regarding the deposit. The reason I mentioned this, again, it seems very simple because everyone, everyone tells me, hold on, but it's just a deposit. Why is the payment of the deposit complicated in the least? You're right. It shouldn't be complicated. The problem is, as we go forward and as we advance as investors, certain little tricks start getting um, implemented by purchasers. Then little tricks start getting implemented by sellers. And you, then you tend to find that the game has changed. The norms have all of a sudden shifted. And we now need to try to determine what the industry actually expects when it comes to the payments of the deposit. So keep in mind that a deposit, is there is no legal requirement. So you never need to pay a deposit when making offers. And that is a question that I get all the time where there's an expectation that a 10% or 20% deposit must be paid with every transaction. This is not the case. We have a lot of deals out there going forward where sellers are not taking in deposits. But then why? What would the purpose of a deposit be? Please bear in mind that a deposit is skin in the game. It's a commitment because if you're putting money down a seller is more likely to be interested to take your deal. It's also a level of security because there are certain circumstances where if a deal cancels at a very late stage, there's some wasted costs and possible agent's commission that needs to be paid. So a seller finds that the payment of the deposit also serves as security for any of these liabilities. And financing is also quite important because the reality is that some banks aren't willing to give a 100% loan. So the deposit is actually essential if a person wants to buy the property. And these are some of the considerations to keep in mind. And so as a buyer, um, is there an expectation to pay a deposit? There might be, depending on the seller that you're approaching. But if you are going to pay a deposit, please be careful. And these are some of the tricks that I've noticed occasionally. When it comes to who actually receives the deposit, we've seen a lot of transactions where the sellers try appropriate their deposit right from the beginning. This should not be the case. You're looking to pay this deposit to an estate agent. You're looking to pay this deposit to an attorney. Please don't pay it directly to the seller. In fact, I've seen some contracts where even if it does get paid to an agent or an attorney, there's a specific term in the contract that allows the seller to use the deposit in order to defray some of the costs in the transaction. This is very risky because if the seller makes use of the money, the money is gone. For you to try and acquire that money or retrieve that money is virtually impossible. So guys, be careful. Make sure that the the deposit sits in an attorney's trust account and, and stays in that trust account until registration takes place. You also need to make an, you also need to look at what the fate of the deposit if the sale does not proceed. That's also very important, but we'll briefly touch on that when it comes to uh, the next clause, which is penalties. As a seller, is there an expectation to pay a deposit? Look, I'm not going to lie to you. As a seller, I always expect there to be a deposit because I want to make sure that there is skin in the game. Um, again, as a seller now, you want to protect yourself. So you also want to make very specific provisions in the contract for what the fate, or what the fate of the deposit is if the sale doesn't proceed. So now it comes to penalties, and this is where we tie in with the deposit. The deposit is a form of commitment, but it's also a form of security. 
So what you want to try and make happen is that the penalty clause, especially if you're a seller, you want the penalty clause to be clear and unambiguous. Because if you need to access these funds for the payment of estate agents or for the payment of some wasted costs, you need to make sure that your clause is very specific to say that you will be entitled to access those funds and use it to pay these costs. There's a lot of clauses out there, for example, dealing with ROCOP and, and the like, but unfortunately, these clauses aren't always, apologies, these clauses aren't always um, enforceable in our law because sometimes, for example, let's say a deposit is 200,000 and, you know, there's a mere maybe uh, 10,000 rand in wasted costs or 50,000 rand in estate agent's commission. In cases like that, we tend to, the, the, the courts tend to favor the purchaser trying to get their deposit back because the purchase, uh, the seller did not suffer that much. And there's a level of objectivity and prejudice. The court will consider what prejudice the seller suffered and will compensate the seller appropriately. And retaining a 200,000 Rand deposit possibly for 50,000 Rand damages is not something that the courts easily allow. So please bear in mind that when drafting these type of provisions, you want to make sure that a certain amounts are catered for, that you know when you can access those funds. And generally speaking, um, you, you, you access those funds in a specific way. And if, if there is a clause where the entire amount is retained, please just bear in mind that in those instances, there might be a case to be made out where the purchaser can um, at least obtain a refund on a, of a portion of these amounts. The next, um, the next clause that's also um, um, merits consideration and is actually very, very important in the, in the, 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 the property investor's journey is the conditions. Now, when I say conditions, I refer to suspensive conditions. Now, why are these so important? And now, a lot of you through education would have heard that exit provisions are normally set out as suspensive conditions. Now, why is that? Because a suspensive condition, all that means is that a suspensive condition is a clause that is based on an uncertain future event. So to give you an example, right? If you want to buy a property, but you're uncertain whether you're going to get a loan from a bank, you want to suspend the operation of the contract until you know whether you will ret obtain that loan or not. And what this effectively means is if you don't obtain the loan, the contract lapses and falls away and neither party is bound to the other. So you've got a contract that's not enforceable amongst the parties. And that is very important for a property investor because remember, you as a buyer don't always necessarily know how much of a loan a, um, a bank will give you. For example, if you buy a property, I always suggest considering things like due diligence, for instance, because if you buy a property and commit, but you need a little bit more time to go through the property and you haven't been able to do this prior to making the offer, nothing stops you from making the offer and, and basically showing your commitment. However, you still want to create a scenario that gives you or that affords you the opportunity of doing an assessment and pulling out if it turns out that this property isn't fit for purpose or isn't fit uh, to your size or these defects that um, required a bit more of an investigation. I mean, once you start getting into bigger deals, this is when you start looking at um, uh, rental roles, for example, um, where you buy a building and there's a couple of tenants in the building. You want to have due diligence done regarding the payment of rent by all these tenants. So these are very, very, very important things to consider when making an offer. These are your exit clauses because these clauses allow you to make provision for situations that you're uncertain of and want to make 100% sure will work out prior to over committing yourself in terms of the sale. The one thing that I need to warn uh, persons about, please, is there's a concept in our law that's called fictional fulfillment. Now, what fictional fulfillment means is that if there is a suspensive condition in the contract that requires fulfillment, but the person, normally the purchaser, does nothing to attempt to fulfill this condition, our law deems them to have fulfilled it. So if, take, for example, a loan to the bank. You make a contract subject to you applying to the bank for a loan. 
but say you don't apply to the bank for the loan or you drag your feet in applying for the bank. You don't do everything in good faith to obtain that loan. In a situation like this, the law, the courts, will not consider you to have acted bona fide. And because of this, the courts may consider this to be a fictional fulfillment, meaning that the suspensive condition has been fulfilled as a result of which you are now bound by the contract. So guys, suspensive conditions do not mean that we can put lies in the contract that we never intend to comply with and we put it there in the hope that 14 days goes by, oh, there is no loan, I can get out of this transaction. That's not the intention of suspensive conditions. The intention is to put in clauses there that lead up to a certain position that allow you to feel certainty as to whether you want to go ahead with the sale or not. So be honest in these conditions. Yes, you can use them strategically. They're there for a reason. You have to use them. But don't lie in the contract. Put conditions there that you never have any intention of fulfilling. So guys, that is that is it from me. I really hope that this was, um, that this was helpful and informative. Uh, please come visit me in my booth. We have a lot of downloadable material for you uh, that, um, that you guys can get a hold of and we'll be there uh, to answer all your questions. Have a great one.